Welcome to our Tuesday, April 6th City Council meeting. We're very pleased that people have been able to join us to see all the fine work that's happening in your city. Before we officially open our meeting, however, be, transparency is a really important value driver in our city. And to that end, I'm going to introduce the laudable assistant city manager, Matt Rojanasa Thera, who will explain to folks how they can participate in our meeting. So Nat, will you do that, please? I'd be happy to. And um, first I will uh, say that uh, there are a few ways that members of the public can participate in our city council meetings. The first is to join directly on ZoomGov using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device. And the second method is to call into the meeting by telephone. To join on your computer, smartphone, uh, or, or telephone, you can use the link or the phone number that is listed on our agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. And since our meeting has already started, you'll find the agenda under the recent tab. To join by telephone, please dial toll-free 833-568-8864 and then enter the meeting ID, which is 160-772-9333 pound. And if you're prompted to enter a participant ID, press pound one more time. Detailed instructions on how to use Zoom is available on our website at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by clicking on the raise hand button at the top, bottom of your screen. If you've dialed in by phone, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself again by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it's their turn to speak. We'll be calling on each public speaker in the order of their hands raised and ask that individuals please stay within a three minute time limit established for today's meeting, which will be showing on a countdown timer on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. This meeting is also being streamed live on YouTube with a 10 second delay and on Comcast channel 25, which has a 90 second delay. As always, we look forward to receiving public comment this afternoon. Well done, thank you. <clears throat> so we will uh, call our meeting to order officially. And what I, just before we do the flag, I would ask our learned city clerk, Clementine, to introduce your caring city council, please. Yes, council member Albert. Here. Council member Hoffa. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Council Member Williamson. And I'm here. <laughs> and Mayor Roberson. Yes, here and we're ready to go. Uh, Clementine, are you going to put up the uh, flag over Colton Hall for us? I will, let me get that up. Hang on one second. We've had some tech is issues with the city clerk's office, but I've got that ready, just one second. Okay. All right, there it is. So I would invite uh, you to please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under one nation indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and justice for all. I was thinking, uh, I often think about the last uh, phrase of the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all. And that's a perfect uh, introduce, uh, introduction, I think, into our first side of a business, which is to pass a resolution denouncing hate crimes and bigotry targeting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. I'm very grateful to Vice Mayor and Council Member Tyler for bringing this to this, this council meeting for a resolution. As we go forward, I would suggest that people read the resolution. It is an incredibly well-written document talking about historically, a nutshell historically about the bigotry and prejudice towards Amer uh, Asian Americans. And even though the recent events, of course, has brought this more to our attention, 
I think if you take a look at that resolution and go back uh, back in history, you can see that's something that certainly needs to be rectified. We like to think these things are behind us, but unfortunately, they face us every day. So I'm going to turn this back to our laudable assistant city manager, Nat. And now you want to put this into context, then I'm going to go to the vice mayor, Tyler, for an introduction and his thoughts. Sure, sure. Happy to provide uh, some context. And uh, first off, on behalf of our Monterey City staff, we thank Vice Mayor Williamson for sponsoring this resolution and bringing this to the city council uh, to consider this item. As uh, we all know, hate crimes and bigotry towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, also known as AAPI, has been on our radar screen, and um, we, we appreciate that uh, this is being brought forward. As many of you recall, on June 5th of last year, our executive team signed a letter to the community in response to the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and many other Black lives. We, we made a statement against racism, made a statement against bigotry, violence, and discrimination. And we stand behind that statement today as a staff. We declared that it is our responsibility to ensure that we serve everyone in the community with dignity, with fairness, with respect. And uh, racial equity is indeed a moral and ethical duty of all of our city employees at all levels, not just managers, but our planners, our engineers, librarians, maintenance workers, police officers, firefighters, just to name a few. Our staff supports this resolution as it condemns racist attacks against Asian Americans in all forms and calls on the community to work together to ensure that AAPI visitors and community members feel safe. Some of you know that I'm a first generation American. You know, both of my parents were born and raised in Thailand. Uh, they were, they moved here in the 1970s and are now naturalized citizens of the United States. And last week when my mom was visiting us here in Monterey, she told me that she was worried about whether it was safe to go to the Asian grocery store anymore. Mm. And uh, she makes the trip once or twice a week to the Asian supermarket, just like I did once or twice a week when uh, I grew up in the Bay Area. You know, you can't go to the Safeway to find the ingredients to make a, a really good pot thai or a good, uh, a good dish. And Asian Americans, whether they've been in the United States for four days, four decades, or like many Montereyans, four generations should not have to experience the fear uh, due to bigotry or violence when they're doing routine activities like going to the grocery store. So this resolution is just one part of the bigger puzzle. It's a citywide effort on our social justice efforts as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Back in October, city council adopted a resolution that committed the city's support to achieve racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. And then on December 15th, the city council received a report from the Monterey Police Department on its commitment to equity and policing by the use of fair and impartial policing practices. Staff continues to work behind the scenes as council has directed to develop and present a comprehensive plan that incorporates policies, procedures, and priorities that address diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're addressing this not only within our organization, but also externally among the city's boards and commissions and in the community. Internally, our HR team has been working with a well-known diversity and inclusion training consultant to launch an employee survey and a diversity assessment that's leading up to a citywide training that we will be conducting in June and July. One area that we're working on is to identify the framework by which we interpret Monterey's diverse history to ensure that it's inclusive of, of uh, the entire community, all populations, not ignore the subjugation of native runs and Ohlone people who were all here before we were, or the Chinese fishing village that existed in present day Cannery Row, which the resolution before you today refers to. Just last week, Hans Uslar, our city manager, and I, we met with Brian Corporning. He is Cal State Monterey Bay's chief diversity officer, and we heard his thoughts on how diversity and inclusion efforts from a higher education perspective can apply to the work that we do here in the city of Monterey at the municipal level. And we're glad to report that Brian has volunteered his time to be an informal advisor of sorts to, to the city of Monterey. So that hopefully provides you with a little bit of a background on what we've done and where we're going as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, I'll pass the baton back to Mayor Roberson. Thank you, Ned. Uh, excellent, excellent introduction. So let's go to our, our good friend, Vice Mayor Tyler. Tyler, thank you again on behalf of the entire community for bringing this resolution to us. And uh, please share your th thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for the introduction. And, and I also um, just want to 
give some acknowledgement and appreciation to staff. Thanks for the support and getting this on the agenda and, and helping with adding some of the context uh, to, to make it more relevant for our community. Um, so many may see this resolution as insignificant and only words on a paper. I'd ask you to think about it from a different perspective. Imagine you were somebody who identified as Asian American and Pacific Islander. Like some of our city staff, around 8% of our residents, like many of the visitors who support our local economy. Imagine walking to the grocery store when out of nowhere you feel a set of hands violently shoving you into the cement, causing your skin to tear and bruise. You wonder, what could have caused somebody to do that to me? Hmm. How could I have prevented it? Should I, have, should I be more cautious when I walk out of the house? Maybe cover my face so people don't notice my identity or organize with my neighbors when we go anywhere outside of the house to create an extra layer of protection. What every single one of us should be asking is, how do we create a world where these type of incidents don't happen? To be, to be, to be complacent and act like this is a normal part of life only adds fuel to the fire. This can become a slippery slope because once we allow it to happen in relation to one identity, things can quickly snowball, creating further and deeper divisions amongst our individual identities. We've seen the results of this in the past, Nazi Germany, and we've seen it more recently with Donald Trump. This is not about political party affiliation. It's about treating the various identities in our communities with dignity and respect. When we allow this behavior to manifest, we have nobody else to blame other than ourselves. We must work together, stay united, and understand that the violation of human rights in one group is a violation of human rights to us all. I requested this resolution to be on tonight's agenda because I want all of our community members, neighbors, visitors, and city staff who identify as Asian American and Pacific Islander to know that we're not okay with the hate and bigotry being displayed across the country due to COVID-19 being classified as the Chinese virus. In fact, we're not okay if this happens to anybody, anywhere, at any time. These behaviors aren't new and have a long history in our country. I implore you to be attentive to the present stories of our assistant city manager and the impact it's had on him and his family and listen to the stories of those who will speak during public comment. This resolution, though a small effort, can make a huge difference. Thank you, Tyler, excellently said. Uh, I'm, I'm sure and I'm hoping we have a public comment. Let's go to public comment, then we'll bring it back for council discussion and action, if that sounds okay with the council. Okay. So Matt, are, not only are you uh, running our meeting today, you, uh, you're in charge of the timer, Great. as okay. usual. And thank you. And uh, we have uh, Esther Malkin as our first speaker and I'll pull up the timer and uh, ask her to unmute herself. Welcome, Esther. Yep. Hi, everybody. Here we go. Uh, nice to see you all. I just want to thank Tyler for putting this together and making mm -hmm. it official um, for our city. Many of you know that I am Cuban American, first generation, but I'm also Cuban and I also am part Chinese. My, my grandfather on my mother's side was Chinese. And so I have been um, very subvertedly um, kind of made indirect comments and when people don't know my ethnicity by just looking at me um, over the years. And so it's important, I think, the more that we hear this um, become more and more in the media, finally, that we address it. And I think it's important not to, not to just address the, the ones that we can see outwardly. For example, over the years, I've been around people that have made disparaging comments about Jewish people. And then when I tell them I'm Jewish, they look, they look at me and they say, well, you don't look Jewish. Uh -huh. And my answer to them is, what does Jewish look like? And so what does Cuban look like? What does, any Hispanic, how do you, how can you tell? So I think it's important um, that we address this in a bigger scale um, because whether it's your skin color or the shape of your eyes or the outwardly seen things um, that people can judge you on and decide whether or not they want to attack you or otherwise, 
um, we, we need to kind of make it a broader statement. And I think that we've been approaching this as a country just as a whack-a-mole kind of scenario. It's this week, it's the Asians. You know, a couple of months ago it was, was the Black Lives Matter. Um, we've had Hispanic issues also come up. And so this is an important thing, but I think we need to address it in a way that isn't just the obvious by the way people look. Um, and I just will close by saying that this is um, an important enough issue to me that I am a member of, of the Democratic Women's Club Inclusion and Diversity Committee as well. And I applaud you guys for um, taking this seriously enough. And I think it should be taken a step further and be more inclusive and go a step further than what we see the county's resolution look like by including, you know, sexuality and other, you know, not so visible ways that people are discriminated against in the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And uh, we'll go to Jerry Lowe Sabato. You could unmute yourself and uh, we'll then start the clock. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Tyler Williamson and the City Council for um, make, taking a stand to denounce this racism, uh, the bigotry that is going on, it's surging, and uh, it's so troubling. I am a fifth generation descendant of the village that was burned down on the Monterey Peninsula back in 1906. And um, this and racism isn't a new thing, uh, but it is really um, uh, showing up and uh, affecting so many of my friends uh, and myself. And so I stand with uh, you who stand with us uh, to denounce the, these acts of uh, hatred. And uh, I, I want to. Um, just uh, speak out and and ask people to stand up and and speak out, speak out for your friends, uh, because in the past our stories were silenced; they were swept under the carpet, and uh, to the point where my generation didn't even know about uh, the acts of racism that happened to our ancestors. Uh, my auntie was born in the very village that you talked about, the Maccabee Beach Chinese village in 1916. She still lives in Monterey. So mm -hmm. we are not just uh, Asian Americans, we are American. So um, thank you so much uh, for, for speaking out and being a shining example of the kind of leadership that our country needs. Uh, it, it is so appreciative that um, I have friends uh, who are across the country who uh, are, are listening in today. And I know that uh, other of my friends have sent letters um, to you uh, to support what you are doing here today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, let's hear from uh, Elena Loomis. Hi, this is Elena Loomis. I am a longtime Monterey resident, and I'm um, calling in in support of this resolution to thank um, my good friend Tyler Williamson for bringing this forward and thank the city council and city staff for supporting it. Um, it's it's so uh, distressing that we have to do things like this, but um, Monterey, the city of Monterey taking this stand is very important. Um, I agree with what the other two speakers said. Um, unfortunately, racism exists in so many other places um, directed at many of our other communities, uh, including African-Americans, uh, Asian-Americans, Jewish Americans, um, and on. Um, I myself have done diversity and inclusion work with the National Coalition Building Institute for a, nearly 30 years on the Monterey Peninsula. And each year when I have done the work, I think, okay, we're, we're done. This is it. We've, we've made progress. And then something serious, um, unfortunately, happens again. 
So thank you for taking the lead, Tyler. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for letting me speak. And I'm proud to be a member of the city of Monterey community and Monterey Peninsula. And I hope that the other cities on the peninsula, I know Marina has already done a resolution. I hope that the other um, cities, if they haven't already done one, will do one and lead the way for the rest of the cities in Monterey County as well. So thank you for the time and thank you for the resolution. Thank you, Elena. We appreciate your comments. We'll go next to Jeff Uchida. Welcome, Jeff. Good afternoon and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor Roberson and City Council and um, Council Member Tyler Williamson for authoring this resolution. Um, I am the chapter president of the Japanese American Citizen League of the Monterey Peninsula. Um, we're the oldest Asian civil rights organization in the United States. And we have a chapter here that is very small, but still active And our building is down on Adams Street uh, across from Jack's Ballpark in Monterey. And I wanna thank the council for taking the time to uh, bring this attention, bring this to the attention of people. Um, it, it, it's really upsetting to see um, what's going on throughout America. Um, we've had recently a member of our, of our group um, was also a victim of, of verbal uh, intimidation. Um, person lived in New Monterey. And I think this person uh, reported it. Um, I'm sure he did, he, he contacted um, news agency. Um, but I'm also really proud of our group. Um, some of you are, are aware of the, the our hall and our museum that we have. And uh, way back after the war, um, a petition was started. Um, well, actually let's, let me, let me backwards that up a little bit. There was a group in Salinas that did not want the Japanese to return back to the area. There was a group on the peninsula uh, that knew that was so um, unjust that they started a petition to welcome back uh, the Japanese Americans after World War II. Um, many, famous, um, Amer many famous people on the peninsula, John Steinbeck and Doc Ricketts and many others. In fact, some families um, that are still living in Monterey, um, their parents, um, were signers of this uh, petition. So I wanna thank the city council and Mayor Roberson for taking the time to bring this to everyone's attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, next, we have a caller who's joined us by telephone and uh, you're invited, not required, but invited to uh, share your name. Uh, and if you could please unmute yourself by uh, dialing star, six, that would be appreciated, and then we'll be able to hear you. This is Nina Beatty. I want to thank the council too for bringing this resolution forward. Um, this is so necessary to stand up to these, um, I don't even know what to call it, these voices of hate, um, these people that live um, out of fear and shame and, and, and take it out on, on other people, their own flesh and blood, their own kin, because we are, are all related. Um, I was reminded of this um, in a, a, when I was standing down at the windows on the bay um, a number of years ago in a protest to stop the um, war against Syria and Iraq. And as I was standing there with a the sign, um, several people drove by and one person in particular um, said, called out, I love to kill Iraqis, I love to kill Arabs and called me a communist and told me to get a job and um, and various other obscenities. There were, that was coming from several people that drove by. And it reminded me again that we live in a community of people who um, are um, hateful and um, have um, a really uh, what I consider mental illness. Um, and we have to also, I think, address that this, this city has a history of racism that's, that has not been addressed. Um, and it saddens me greatly that, that these acts and these mentalities continue, but we have to keep doing things. And this resolution is an excellent um, uh, public display of support for people. Um, and um, and I, I appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. And uh, we also have here Rob O'Keefe. Hi, Rob. 
Hi, Nat, and uh, thank you, Mayor and Council members. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to put a few words in. Uh, Nat, your 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 comments about um, your mother's visit really inspired me to say something. Um, have to uh, really applaud this this move, um, and thank you so much, Council uh, Member uh, Tyler. Uh, you're just it's so important. It's important for our community. It's important for the industry that I work in. Um, just a few weeks ago, um, our board went through uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Um, uh, my board's made up of, for those who don't know, uh, hospitality industry. And uh, they really embraced the opportunity. At a time where we have so many other things to worry about, we worried about how we can be better than we were before. And we spent a lot of time talking about this. And, and it's so important for a community not to only practice the values associated with DEI, but to proclaim those values. And what you're doing with this resolution, I can't applaud enough. I'm very, uh, I don't know, proud <laughs> more than anything is the, is the emotion uh, that I'm feeling right now to uh, be working with you all in the relationship that we have. And I just want to reinforce how important it is when we welcome visitors who come to us from around the world, they wanna come to a place where they feel safe. They feel welcome and they know that they're going to have an incredible, inspiring experience. This type of move by you waves the important flag that we need to as a community to welcome them here. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for your comments, Rob. Let's go to Al Lee and uh, Al, welcome. Hi. So. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. I am actually a friend of Jerry Lo Sabato. I'm actually um, a New York resident and currently calling in from New York City. And I wasn't going to speak, but I felt compelled to because my husband and I are those visitors that love to come to Monterey every year, actually, before COVID happened. And we are also donors to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And as visitors to Monterey, we it is important for us to feel safe in um, Monterey, the place where we, you know, we truly feel like harbors a beautiful environmental education. Um, so, you know, in, in the last, you know, year with this whole event of COVID, uh, Jerry and I have been communicating back and forth about um, the rising anti-Asian uh, attacks and it really touches my heart to see that Monterey is making this move and where I live right now, you know, we're struggling to um, do what you are doing today. So, you know, to watch what's happening here in Monterey, uh, it just really touches my heart. And I'm um, so thankful for you guys taking this uh, step and kind of showing the rest of the, the community, the rest of the country, what should be done um, and I also want to add that, you know, I really feel compelled um, to tell people that our educational system is not sufficient in addressing the inclusion of all minorities in this country from the beginning of the foundation of the United States. Um, you know, Asians have been here, Filipinos were first here in the 1600s. And you know, Asian Americans have uh, fought in American wars since the War of 1812. And, you know, a lot of this history is not taught in schools. And I'm compelled to um, really ask everyone to think about ways in which we can reach out to our libraries and educational systems, our schools, and see how we are doing to incorporate this education into the school system, because the people who are so hateful today, as the previous caller just mentioned, I feel that it is because of their lack of knowledge and awareness. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks for calling in. Okay. That, uh, I believe, concludes public comment on uh, our first item of the afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good. Well, we, we want to entire council thanks people who did phone in and shared their stories. We appreciate that. So the next item would be a motion uh, to approve the resolution and, but we can have council discussion first. 
So shall we do that, Tyler? Why don't you start our discussion, please? Yeah, Mayor, I was just hoping that Nat could maybe share a screen. Uh, after I uh, submitted the resolution, I wanted to include some additional language. So I sent in uh, an additional paragraph to him. And okay. if we could take a look at that just so that everybody feels comfortable and what, what I'm requesting to be included would be much sure. appreciated. I think MK actually has the uh, slide uh, for us, or Clementine. So It's yeah. a team effort. So <laughs> <laughs> It takes a team. That's right. So I'll just read it for those that aren't able to see the screen. I know that some fo folks are calling in, but there's a whereas that describes discrimination occurs to a greater extent with those who identify with two or more aspects, um, i.e. race, gender, sexual orientation, age, nationality, disability. An example of this is seen in the recent increase of hate crimes with the Asian American community, particularly women. Thank you, Tyler. Absolutely. I'm very comfortable with that. So uh, council comments before we pass a resolution, I'll open the floor. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor. Council member Ed, please. Uh, yeah, absolutely the right thing to do. Um, uh, just it's deplorable to see and hear the news uh, that we have all witnessed this last uh, year, uh, particularly the violence. Um, it's just entirely unacceptable uh, no matter who the intended victim is. And I would just say, you know, as, as you all know, my time in law enforcement as a young, young man right out of college, the realization that there are uh, sadly uh, evil people and wicked people with uh, wicked intentions. And through the years, the opportunity to serve victims, to serve those that uh, had been attacked or those that had been um, singled out just because of their race or um, their nationality or their or the way they look or um, you know a variety of reasons that just is unacceptable and deplorable to me so from the highest level that we can say that um, uh, Gracie you too uh, that all all people are truly created in the eyes of God as equal uh, there is no differentiation. Uh, between uh, a person because of their look or their choice of sexuality or any of the circumstances. We just need to make sure that we recognize that we must welcome all people, treat all people with the utmost respect and realize that um, right now what's going on, uh, people do not deserve uh, to be attacked and we must step up. And if you see anything, absolutely step in, absolutely call. Don't stand by and be a bystander. Get involved and make sure that we participate in, in defending humankind uh, wherever we see abuses occurring. But uh, looking forward to uh, voting for this and, and echoing the, uh, the whereases and the particular details uh, to make a statement that Monterey absolutely respects and uh, loves all people, and we will defend your right to be who you are. You're muted, Mayor. Yeah, I just noticed, thank you. And so thank you, Ed, for very nicely said. Uh, Council Member Dan? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Council Member Williamson, thank you very much for bringing this uh, to our attention and, and uh, authoring this uh, resolution, really, really appreciate it. I'm glad you're on our council to, to, to make uh, moves like this that it's important in our city. I just wanted to mention uh, one thing that is still um, in the back of my mind that uh, only in 80 years ago that, um, that once again, uh, the fear of people uh, bring racism and uh, hatred. And, and I hate to see that again, um, and because as Jeff messaged, mentioned, uh, Jeff Uchida, that uh, 80 years ago, uh, some of his relatives were were uh, abused in that way uh, and, and shown racism and had to leave the peninsula. And, and there is so much um, good that happens with uh, our Asian community and what they have given our community. And I, I really hate to see something like that happen. And as uh, my wife and my, my daughter who are uh, Filipino of de Filipino descent, I hate to see any of this hatred being pointed at uh, any of, of, of their relatives. So again, uh, Williams, uh, Councilman Williams, thank you very much for bringing us together 
uh, and bringing us all together because I think that's what, what's really important. And um, I, I'd like to make the motion uh, to go ahead and, and, um, and pass this resolution. I'll, I'll second the motion. And then um, just briefly say, you've all said, said everything really well as, as have the public. So I don't need to repeat it. Just proud to support this, proud to be um, a member of the city of Monterey. And uh, it was also really nice to hear from Jerry Lo Sabado. And, um, you know, as always, to, you know, be reminded of the important contributions of Asian Americans to our city. So thank you. Thank you, Council. All, all very well spoken and heartfelt. As I was listening to uh, our, our friends who spoke in the public, I was thinking about the language capital of the world where we all come together from myriad nationalities. The Defense Language Institute, of course, uh, Middlebury Institute, Naval Postgraduate School, then the, the Chinese festival that was launched not too long ago here in the city. I think about kids uh, graduating from school and where we promise them at graduations that the will, world is theirs and all they have to do is work hard. And I'm thinking we have to guarantee that's true because we know that's not true. A lot depends on your station in life. And when I think about uh, when Jeff was talking about the Japanese hall, when we have the students from the now who come, you have about eight to 12 students from Nanao, Japan who come and they stay with host families and those same host families send their children to Nanao and the kids get it right. You should see uh, the ceremonies when at the end, it's a 10 day stint and, and you should see it when they have a ceremony and they dance and sing and so on, they have become family. So we'll let them lead us. So we have a motion and a second, any more comments? I just wanted to give my appreciation. This is one of the reasons why I really like being part of this council. It, it warms my heart to hear uh, the positive affirmation from all my colleagues and and uh, from the community. So I'm, I'm glad that we're standing together on this and, and I'm glad that we're taking the lead. I'll say one other thing too, in regards to Jerry's comment, um, uh, Ivan and I walk a lot um, on, on the rec trail um, early in the morning before the day starts. and. We pass by where the um, where the camp used to be all the time, but it wasn't until Jerry was talking to me that she had pointed out that there's a, a placard there. So I just encourage anybody, if you're ever walking on the rec trail, um, to keep an eye out for that and just kind of take a moment to to read what's there and kind of uh, um, absorb that experience and what it must have been like. Um, it's a it's a, a nice tribute to to the history of of our region. Well, thank you, Tyler. So before I uh, ask for roll call, I'd like to read the therefores of the resolution. And therefore, be it resolved that the city of Monterey calls on all residents and leaders to join us in condemning racial racist attacks against Asian Americans in all forms and renewing our commitment to speak out against such attacks, defend and protect those targeted and seek justice and accountability against those who commit hate crimes against AAP um, uh, I members of our community and being further resolved that the city of Monterey denounces hate crimes, hateful rhetoric, and hateful acts against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and works to ensure that AAPI visitors and community members feel safe and welcome both during this COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And that's our resolution that we're voting on. Roll call, please, Clementine. Um, so, Hafa? Yes. Albert? Yes. Williamson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Roberson? Yes. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take a deep breath and we're going to <laughs> go to a, another very serious topic. It, it was interesting when, uh, Tyler, you first brought this forward, I was thinking about four goals that the president has articulated, a lot of people have articulated, and it was something that I shared during the campaign and that, that was 
there are really four major topics facing us right now. Number one, of course, is the pandemic, which we're not gonna go into, it's so complicated, but getting ourselves healthy, safe, vaccinated, or at least herd immunity. And secondly is national economic recovery, and that includes the city budget. Then the third, which we've talked a lot about, was social equity, and that includes economic and cultural equity and the opportunity to um, share in the American dream. And then after uh, social equity, there's the whole idea of climate warming, recycling, sea level rise. So we're hitting all, all four of those this evening, I think. So on the last one, there was a bill passed, a Senate Bill 1383, and we're gonna hear uh, very shortly about that. And interestingly enough, today I had an opportunity to attend a webinar. There were 125 members from all over the state who attended the webinar. And amazingly enough, it went quite well. So yeah, I guess if, if one would say there has to be, uh, are there any good side effects to this whole situation? Well, we're probably able to attend webinars and see people that normally we would not be able to see. So I think that platform will stay with us. And part of it was uh, talking about Senator Laird and Senator Laird's attempt to help us uh, implement SB 1383. As you know, Senator Laird has uh, just been our new Senator. He was the Secretary for Natural Resources, longtime assembly member. And he and I were co-mayors in the 1980s. And he's just a, a really good guy, a big time environmentalist. And he's helping the League of Cities take a look at this bill and to be talking about how can we uh, implement this bill because the goals and intentions are excellent, but the whole idea is how do you make it happen? And so we have some uh, partners with us today who uh, Nat, you or Ted may want to introduce or helping us with this. It's really a fascinating subject. Our, our discussion today was it's the right thing to do. And the devil's in the details. The next question is how can we make it happen? The, and so, Rather than go on too far, this is certainly environment, one of my favorite subjects. I'll turn it over to Nat to make some introductions and prepare to, for a really excellent presentation. Sounds great. Thank you, Mayor Riverson. And uh, before I introduce Ted Tarasas, our sustainability coordinator, as uh, Mayor Riverson mentioned, SB 1383 was signed into law by Governor Jerry Brown Jerry. back in September of 2016, and it establishes emission reduction targets in a statewide effort uh, on to reduce emissions on what's called SLCP or short-lived climate pollutants. And part of that strategy is to achieve certain organic waste disposal reduction target levels. With 2014 as a baseline, it requires reductions of 50% by 2020 and then 75% by 2025. You'll be hearing this afternoon a presentation from Philip Menolfi, I believe, a project manager from HF&H consultants, a consultant to the Monterey Regional yeah. Waste Management District, and he'll provide an overview of what we see as a local jurisdiction and what we will be required to do in terms of collection service, food recovery, education, procurement, inspection, and also enforcement. We also have joining with us today, Tim Flanagan, General Manager of the Monterey Regional Waste Management District, and Tim Brownell, the uh, Director of Operations. But before we get to them, uh, if Ted Tarasas has a few words to share. Uh, pass it on to Ted. Sure, thank you, uh, Nat. Uh, just yeah, very quickly, um, wanted to, to echo, we've uh, been working with uh, HFNH for, for quite a long time. They've been a great partner with us uh, out at the Monterey Regi Regional Waste Management District. And um, we've been working for several months, uh, pretty much weekly, uh, on trying to address these sorts of challenges with, with SB 1383. So with a lot of these deadlines coming due in January 1st, uh, unless uh, some of that changes, but we basically have to prepare as though that is gonna be the case and we have to move forward planning that way right now. So uh, with that in mind, uh, just wanted to turn it over to Phil to go over to some of the uh, details uh, of what we're looking at with 1383 in the coming months and some of the programs we're going to be enacting. So uh, uh, Mr. Mainolfi, uh, go ahead and, and take over. Thanks, I'm gonna share my screen now. And thank you, Mayor Roberson and the council for allowing me to speak today. And thank you, Nat and Ted for the introduction. 
Um, as Matt had mentioned, SB 1383 is one of the largest pieces of the largest mandate since AB 939 over 30 years ago. The primary objective is to reduce short term climate pollutants, and that's going to occur through a 50% reduction in organics that's disposed at landfill by 2022 and a 75% reduction in disposed organics by 2025. Additionally, SB 1383 requires that 20% of edible food that's currently disposed at a landfill is recovered for human consumption. It's important to note that these are statewide goals opposed to prior legislation, which would be placed directly on a jurisdiction. So the 50%, 75%, and 20% goals are not placed on the city of Monterey. In the past, we've had leeway to choose and select programs that would get us to the percentages, but CalRecycle was not given that autonomy to let us do that. Therefore, there's programmatic requirements. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the background and context behind SB 1383. Then I'll delve into the regulatory requirements. And finally, we'll explore the city of Monterey's path towards compliance and how to best achieve regulatory compliance. So first let's define organic waste since the definition has been ex expanded under the new legislation and it may differ from what the common vernacular. Under SB 1383, organic waste includes green waste or yard waste, wood waste, and food waste. Prior legislation, AB 1826, did not include food waste for the multifamily sector, and other prior bills like AB 1594 and other legislation did not consider food waste in the residential sector. Additionally, organics includes fibers such as paper and cardboard, which we traditionally consider recyclables. Now that's considered organics as well. Um, so why are we targeting organic waste in the first place? And there's a, quite a few reasons, but I'll touch on only a few of them tonight. In 2017, Californians disposed of 27 million tons of organic waste, 6 million of which was wasted food. When we couple that with the growing food insecurity problem, there's an obvious opportunity to close the loop and create a circular economy. Prior to COVID, one in five children was food insecure. And by recent reports, it appears that number is trending in the wrong direction. So getting food out of the landfill, not wasting it, and getting it to feeding organizations and those in need is a primary goal of the legislation. Additionally, we've seen the ramifications of climate change over the past year, particularly here in California, where it's manifested itself through rising sea levels, coastal erosion, cyclical droughts, heavier storms, and forest fires, which have cost the Central Valley over $2.7 billion dollars and 20,000 jobs in 2015 alone. This brings us to the back to the question, why food waste when we're talking about methane? And that's because when organic waste, such as food waste and green waste decomposes in landfills, it emits, it emits methane, which is considered a super pollutant. It's 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide over a 20 year horizon. Considering that landfills account for approximately 21% of the state's methane emissions, it makes it a high priority target for reduction and it's not just the landfill and recycling, they're also targeting dairies, but it's local municipality, the organics and the food waste recycling is the important part that you'll need to consider. So there's quite a few dates here, but I urge you to focus on the right side from January 1, 2022 on. The rulemaking started in 2016, as Nat had mentioned, it took two years of informal rulemaking and another year of formal rulemaking with the regulations finally being adopted last fall. Um, and so really your focus is going to be January 1, 2022. That's when the state is looking for the mandatory programs to be included, and we'll discuss what those are. Beginning January 1, 2024, if generators within your community of organic waste are non-compliant, you'll be forced to take progressive enforcement actions, and that's going to include notices of violation, and ultimately it can result in fines if it's not remediated. So what are... What are some of these programs required under these dates? Beginning January 1, 2022, it's essential that all jurisdictions provide organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses. Uh, that's going to include a mandatory service ordinance to require them to have organic collection services. Also have to establish edible food recovery programs to get that food out of the landfill and get it to food insecure feeding organizations and services to better serve the community. Obviously, for all of this to happen, you're going to need to conduct education and outreach. People will not know how to participate in the programs if we don't tell them about the new programs, how they can participate. Additionally, because there's going to be a lot of new recovered organic waste products, things like CNG, renewable natural gas, compost, mulch, 
we need to close the loop with all of those products. So the state is looking to municipalities to help find a home for all of these new products and replace some of the less sustainable products we've used historically. And finally, the states acknowledge that there's insufficient capacity to recover all of this edible food and divert the remaining organics that can't be recovered for humans to composting and other recovery activities. So capacity planning and infrastructure development is a key piece of SB 1383. Luckily, you're well positioned and we'll cover that a little bit more later in the presentation. And as I be mentioned, beginning January 1, 2024, you'll be required to take enforcement action against non-compliant entities. The goal behind this is that beginning 2022, your programs will be implemented and you have two years of educating the people that are participating in the programs. They don't have you finding them from day one. There's two years for you to educate them if they're not complying, they're not properly sorting their recyclables. And then beginning 2024, that's when the enforcement piece will kick in. So under the regulations, there's multiple options for compliance. There's all sorts of collection options from one container all the way up to four container. But it's most important and probably the most feasible for your community to go with a three container source separated collection approach. You have MRWMD who has the facilities to process this material. And going back to 2011, when you signed your franchise agreement, the imposition of food waste was contemplated. Currently have green waste collection and there's an opener in the agreement for the addition of food waste to the residential services. In addition to providing this service, you'll also be responsible for, minim for minimizing contamination. And that's gonna happen through on, on route reviews where lid flipping is occurring to ensure that organics are not being placed with the recyclables and that organics are getting their way out of the trash. Or it could happen at the facilities that's processing your material through waste evaluation studies. I had mentioned earlier that there's mandatory service for all generators. Jurisdictions have the option to issue waivers for commercial generators who have de minimis volumes or space constraints, but jurisdictions are not required to offer these. We've seen quite a few large cities that have chosen not to offer the waiver programs because they believe, you know, there's a solution around the space constraints, whether it be split bins or more frequent service and smaller bins. And also it acknowledges that there may be an administrative burden to trying to issue these waivers and renew them and verify whether it's a true space constraint. Um, jurisdictions will also be required to establish an edible pro food recovery program. And there's four primary elements to this. First is to work with the county to identify existing food recovery capacity. And the second is to work with the county to expand edible food recovery capacity if there's insufficient capacity in your region. And the reason that they have cities working with counties is because food insecurity is a regional approach. There's often food recovery organizations and services that provide services to jurisdictions where they're not domiciled. So the food bank could serve you know, multiple communities, not just the city where it's domiciled. Additionally, the city will be required to monitor commercial edible food generators. These are large supermarkets and grocery stores and it goes down to a smaller subset beginning 2024 to ensure that they're recovering the maximum amount of edible food for human consumption. So this will look like a reorganization or service or donation receipts when they, if they self-haul it to those. And finally, you'll be required to, edible, to educate edible food generators of the program. So the education requirements or that you provide annual education and outreach to all generators regarding collection service requirements, contamination standards, self haul requirements, and just overall compliance with SB 1383, in addition to the prior edible food recovery education I talked about. Additionally, this media will, collateral will need to be translated for linguist, linguistically isolated households. People who do not speak English or have a hard time, it will have to be translated, and it can be either provided via print media or electronically. Education is already contemplated in Article 2 of your franchise agreement, so this isn't necessarily a large new program. It's going to be a tailoring and shifting of your prior education program to include the minimum educational requirements. But of course, you're always welcome to go above and beyond. I mentioned earlier that you'll be responsible for recovered organic waste product procurement. Um, there's two primary procurements or procurement requirements. The first is that you procure compost, RNG, mulch, 
or electricity produced from recovered food or processed food. And there's a minimum per capita procurement target based on your jurisdiction's population. And depending on the commodity, there's a conversion factor because different commodities have different economic, or economic and environmental benefits. In addition to that, the procuring these new commodities, they'll be required to procure paper uh, products in conjunction with the state's code. And what that says is that you have to buy recycled content if it's the same price or less than virgin material products. And this is talking about paper, writing supplies, tissue, things like that at city facilities. Knowing what we know now, it's approximately 30% higher to buy these commodities. You know, recycled content paper is more expensive if you go to Staples. And given everything going on with the green fence, national sword, and blue sky, and the international markets, it's unlikely to see that that tip and go lower in the next couple of years, although it may eventually as the technology increases and we develop more domestic markets in manufacturing. So in terms of jurisdiction requirements and enforcement, the first major critical path item, and we'll readdress this because it is a critical path item, is developing an ordinance. You'll have to adopt mandatory service ordinances and you'll have to have an enforcement ordinance as well which can be posted to begin 2024. Obviously, in order to do this, it's critical path because it needs to be adopted prior to January 1, 2022, when you consider multiple readings at council and the work that goes into this, you wanna do that efficiently and quickly to make sure you're not being fined by power cycle. We also have to implement a compliance monitoring and education plan from 2022 to 2024, which will revive result in annual desktop compliance reviews of commercial generators with two or more cubic yards. And this is something that could reasonably be delegated to your franchise hauler. They have the service levels of all the commercial businesses, so they could review that. We also have to do the route reviews or waste evaluations we talked about earlier to ensure that contamination in these streams is being minimized. We've seen large problems with the international commodity markets due to contamination over the past couple of years, potentially the past decade. So that's one thing they're trying to address. And I'm sure Mr. Flanagan from MRWMD can tell you that as they're going through composting, the pre-processing, more contamination means more costs. So you really want clean feedstock for your composting operations to ensure that the compost can be sold to the agriculture markets, also to minimize the pre-processing costs to remove contaminants. And finally, you'll be required to inspect anyone. If you get a complaint that you believe is a reliable complaint, you'll be required to go out and inspect that complaint and verify whether it's true or not. And from 2022 to 2024, if you find violations, you're responsible for educating the generators of the requirements to comply. Beginning 2024, you'll have to complete all of these tasks, but if you see that they're not complying, then you'll have to issue a notice of violation within 60 days of determining that a violation occurred. From the notice of violation, you'll have up to 150 days to issue a penalty. Now you can take intermittent steps between there to remediate the issue and not have to find them, but if after 150 days they're unwilling to comply, you'll have to implement some fines. Cal Recycle estimates that you're going to, that the state's going to need an additional 50 to 100 to 100 new or expanded facilities to process all of this additional organic material. Fortunately, the city and Monterey has Monterey Regional Waste Management District. And they're well positioned to divert this from landfill through the local composting infrastructure that's been developed. The state also has an enforcement role. While cities and other jurisdictions are eligible for waivers, the city of Monterey is not. You're not considered a low population jurisdiction or a rural area, so you are not exempt from this legislation. Um, if there's emergency circumstances that are prevent the use of a facility, so you've quarantined for bugs in Orange County before, then they're going to be responsible for dealing with that and the oversight of your programs. And the state's also responsible for overseeing the city, but also non-local entities, state agencies, and facilities, which have historically been problematic with waste bills. They're also going to be monitoring your compliance. And while that process is still being worked out, they have made the comment that they're going to come out beginning of 2022 and be looking for ordinances and franchise agreements, purchasing policies and other policies that comply with SB 1383, which is why we recommend those as critical path items. You have your ordinance and franchise agreement that puts you well positioned 
and you can demonstrate to CalRecycle that you're at least contemplating compliance and working towards achieving it. And you're going to be required to keep records on all aspects of these programs in what's called an implementation record. It's a centralized digital or physical record of all of the different programs from inspections, notices of violation, any education you provide, to whom you provide it. All of the data points surrounding these programs will be required to be in the implementation record and the state can come within 10 business days and look at it. This is obviously not something that can be compiled after the fact within 10 days, so we need to contemplate the imposition of centralized record keeping. And then finally, the state can issue notices of violation if you're found to be not compliant. And if you're not compliant, we'll issue that notice of violation, you'll have up to 90 days to comply. And if you've made substantial effort, meaning everything you can do, then they may extend that for up to 24 months or even 36 months if there's an infrastructure limitation. But they have acknowledged that things like not willing to take a rate increase to council or not willing to read the ordinances, those don't count as substantial effort. You have to do everything within your power. So now I'll talk about a little bit about what's been done and then the next critical step. So tax subgroups have been set up and they're meeting to explore regional approaches that may increase efficiencies and also minimize the rate and staffing impacts on, each, on your city. And staff in the regional group is also exploring opportunities to work with additional partners and stakeholders such as the food bank, haulers, and MRWMD, again, to find regional approaches that minimize the burden for each individual member agency. And finally, the, group, the, group is re, the regional group is researching successful programs that have worked in other communities, so hopefully they can leverage some of their learning curve and their experience rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and learning on their own. In terms of next steps, we've highlighted these a little bit before, and that was by design because they're very important. Um, the critical path items are a franchise agreement amendment to ensure that you have your collector and processor doing all that they can to help support these programs. Ordinance updates need to be placed by, in place by January 1, 2022. And then finally, you'll need to develop an outreach and monitoring system. If you're bringing in new programs beginning January 1, 2022, obviously you're gonna to wanna to provide some free education on that to minimize the negative feedback from the community. And that was all I had for you. So give it back to Matt for questions. Well, Ted, uh, our our, Ted, our sustainability coordinator, sounds like you've got a job for life, my friend. <laughs> as, as you were, uh, by, by the way, good overview. I really appreciated that. And we did have, I think in my introduction, I mentioned that we did uh, have a statewide webinar on this. Probably uh, in the city of Monterey, you, we're getting our compactor off the wharf finally, and we're looking at having a, a state-of-the-art uh, recycling center where wet waste from the wharf would will be going out there and will be processed by our local monterey disposal. And I think uh, the aquarium, I believe, is already doing this, and, and many of our hotels are already in the business of doing this. So that that's gratifying. My first question is, as a resident, how am I impacted? What what do I put in my trash cans on the street? Because that's what we're going to hear. And secondly, the less confusing, the better. For example, we have a green can which has uh, yard waste, so to speak. Not even waste, but just yard trimmings. Is that where our edible waste goes? Or does it go down the garbage disposal? Where do we put it? That is a great question. Um, the edible food recovery is targeted towards large commercial generators. The average okay. household is throwing away around five pounds per home. So it's really targeting places that can safely get the food in large volumes to those who need it. As a resident, how this is going to manifest is your food waste is no longer going to go in your black trash bin, but will need to be incorporated and moved to your green bin with your yard waste. And there's okay. multiple mechanisms being explored for that. Obviously, that increases the footprint in your kitchen. So there's kitchen pails that have been offered in a lot of communities that can go in the freezer to minimize odors. And that way, once it fills up, you can take it out. Yeah. Well, we have a compost, just a bucket with a lid on it underneath our sink. And I put it outside in a compost. It does not smell. So, but what do you do in a, in a Los Angeles, in a, in a San Jose and in a San Francisco with uh, 
high density and so on. How are, are how do the residents? In fact, they probably don't even have green waste uh, containers. How do you reach 40 million people? Again, a great question. Um, and you identified one of the largest challenges of SB 1383, which is these denser populations, and particularly the multifamily sectors. As you contemplate all these buildings that had trash chutes built 50 years ago, they don't have extra chutes for the organics. So we're seeing a lot of innovative solutions. Unfortunately, it's coming down to robust education and placement of organic bins in the parking garage generally. Um, but there isn't a great answer on that. And we see quite a bit of contamination in multifamily as well, or these you know, townhomes, because people are divorced from the costs or the bills. If you have 100 users using one bin, if I throw my trash in with the organics and you know, the property manager gets fined, then I don't really see that. So I'm not being held accountable. So you identify one of the largest challenges facing the waste industry, which is those you know, tighter okay, areas. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question, and that is, we talk about edible food at a grocery store, for example, that hasn't been sold. And the question is, how does that get to the food bank? Because you've got a huge infrastructure transportation challenge here. And I don't know if restaurants are required to do that as well. So how, how does that realistically happen? Does the food, the food bank uh, or Meals on Wheels, are they going to provide the vehicles? which means we're gonna to have to up our contributions. Is that going to be through uh, our disposal company? How do we get these uh, unused edibles to the people who need them? We're, we're currently exploring a general approach for how that can best be served. Um, typically, you don't see refuse companies getting involved in the, in the food recovery business. It's not necessarily a great optic. Your trash mm -hmm. company is dropping off food at the local senior center <laughs> bank. <Right>. Um, <laughs> But that, yeah, so we're exploring lots of different options. Um, there's a lot of crowdsourced um, applications and software now, such as Chow Match and Abound Food Care that are working with volunteers. They use Uber drivers who aren't necessarily, who are on the clock, but don't have a ride, they volunteer. Mm. So a lot of different innovative programs for getting them to the food recovery organizations. We also see services that do it, that are willing to drive out and do it either for free or at a charge. So really trying to identify what's the best regional approach that'll minimize the cost impact. Yeah, I think that's going to be another monumental challenge of how you get that food from uh, Safeway and Pacific Grove to the food bank in Salinas. And once it arrives that it's uncontaminated and hasn't spoiled. Yeah, and that's what the bill was set up to try to address that to some extent. So beginning 2022, it's your large supermarkets and grocery stores over 10,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. And it's really shelf-stable food, so you can use something like a box truck to move that. But okay. beginning 2024 is when you start moving into your large restaurants with 250 seats or your hotels with on-site food and 100 rooms. And that's where the food safety becomes more of an issue. So they're hoping that by starting with you know, the shelf-stable food, we can start developing infrastructure and routing or some connection between you know, the food insecure and the edible food generators. That's good. The final question, and this is one that all of our jurisdictions are going to face and that is who pays for this the rate payers so what are we looking at and it's increases. premature to tell you that um, we're still working through program selection so depending on what's delegated to the regional agency or to the hauler and depending on what education programs are tailored to that that's all going to drive it if you decide that you want to have a local route that's doing all of monterey city's food recovery that might be more expensive than partnering at a regional level, level or using a volunteer-based organization. So until we identify all the programs associated with SB 1383, it'd be probably inappropriate to make a guess here. Right, but I think ultimately we need to know it's the ratepayer is going to pay for this. That's correct. Right, and so when we raise uh, we raise fees a dollar, we hear it. I just can't even imagine how the fees are going to go up. But you know what? We have to clean up after ourselves and pay for it. So thank you, for Council, for letting me ask my questions. Any more questions before we go to the public? Council Member Dan, please. Thank you, Mayor Clyde. Good questions, Mayor Clyde. No, those were good. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question. Uh, on. Um, I understand the compliance piece, especially if we don't put the ordinances in place by 2024. I'm sure we'll be out of compliance at the state level, which will make us a, accountable for that. Uh, my question is, once those ordinances are put in place after 2024, and a city 
uh, realizes that there might be um, some residents or some restaurants that are not complying with um, uh, the ordinance, is it the city's responsibility uh, to find that particular restaurant or will it be the uh, Mono Regional Waste Management District because they're the ones that will know whether they're in compliance or not. So I'm still a little confused with who's gonna be responsible for that. Tim or Tim? Well, <laughs> well the, 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 from our district standpoint, so maybe I can address the mayor's last question on that about the rates. So I, I can tell for the residents in Monterey that are on the call and for those in the district, we are all starting at a very good place in relation to rates. And we have done a couple of rate surveys that we're happy to share with staff and residents that our rates at the district are the second lowest in about a hundred mile radius for the services that we provide. And that for you and your hauler, and in fact, for all the district uh, haulers, our rates to our customers in our communities are in the lowest quartile compared to other Bay Area jurisdictions. So, we are starting from a lower base for costs to be increased from. So that is good news is that uh, from the district standpoint and from all the haulers and the refuse companies here, they have managed to keep rates down uh, compared to other Bay Area wide uh, jurisdictions. So that's a good place to start from. To answer uh, uh, Council Member Albert's question is that the district is not empowered with any enforcement uh, act uh, rights or obligations. So we as a special district don't own that type of enforcement right. That would have to be in your own court and code enforcement or turf potentially to the county in their uh, code enforcement through their county health agency. So we don't have the ability to find any of the you know, any of the residents or the customers. What we'll do is that in the bill, there is a provision that we will literally have to go and hire a, probably a third party to lift the lids on all the organic bins and uh, carts that are in town, stick their head in there and see if there is contamination and then have a progressive series of actions around either that business or that homeowner. So we'll actually have to hire a third party to go through and, and lift the lids and evaluate what's in the cart and then you know write or catalog enforcement actions. But the, the district can't do that. That would have to be one of the other agencies that have those type of police powers. Maybe we want, might wanna consider just delegating that to you and giving you the authority to do that. <laughs> Uh, Mayor, I've got the question. Council Member Ed, yes, follow that up with a good one. Hey, Tim, yeah. Elvis, Elvis has left the building with Tim. <laughs> yeah, uh, Tim, Tim, Tim and I have talked before. We understand the, um, the, the threshold and the burden. So, Tim, um, you know, once upon a time when we were in, in starting in the process of recycling plastics bottles, and uh, the city of Monterey had that third can, and it, it started at the curb with a, with a small box, and now we've gone to you know, the blue, blue bin. Um, so you monitor the weight of the trucks that come in. So you know what the truck is bringing in. Mm -hmm. So is there any kind of a state barometer that's going to be looking at um, the differences of a baseline? Say you said a baseline is in 2020 and in 2024, the new standards kick in. Is there going to be some kind of a matrix where they're starting to calculate not so much by the can from a resident, but actually the city of Monterey would be held to the baseline. And in our barometers is really whether or not we're in compliance in our weight load that's going out of organics is less than a base year. So just taking us to a little bit bigger matrix, is this gonna be down to the can of a reg residence or is this gonna be actually looking at the load of what goes from Monterey to your landfill? Well, you know, 
I can try this and then Philip, you may be able to back me up. Is that so the the way that 1383 is drafted, those are statewide uh, goals in terms of diversion. What we will be doing is monitoring, and we do, we weigh your trash and we weigh your yard waste. And on a more you know big picture level, what we are looking to see is the amount of weight shift out of the black container and into either the yard waste container or the recycling container because paper is organic and that does count to your diversion uh, tab table. So that the more paper you recycle, that's organic. The you know, more cardboard you recycle, that's organic. That also counts to that overall denominator numerator, which is what I hear you asking about. So. Yeah, we'll we'll monitor that on a on a macro level, and then your recycling is done by your service provider, Monterey Disposal, up there in Ryan Ranch. We will handle the yard waste and the trash, and then that information gets reported to to Ted, and Ted will make those reports for the city. Is how I see how that monitoring and compliance piece would be going forward. Hmm. Uh, yes, obviously it sounds like the procedures will have to be worked out. We have a lot of questions. We don't know what the answers are. And, and uh, the rule of thumb is you're supposed to always ask a question you already know the answer to, right? <laughs> um, we're in a world where we really don't know what the regulations are going to look like and what the impact will be, um, more so on the residents. I think the commercial is a little easier to uh, you know, you have a container, it's in the kitchen, everything gets scraped in, it's organics, and that that's a, just a little bit easier to police. But when you're talking about a household or an apartment house, um, we've, we've got a lot of things to discover about how this is going to work. And again, I think the mayor covered it. This came with no state money, right? It, right. it, did, it did not, no. So <laughs> Yet, yet. <laughs> All right, thanks. That's the only question I had, Mayor. Uh, other council questions? No questions for me, thanks. All right, let's go to the public then now. Do we have some of our good friends who wanna share with us? We have two friends so far who would like to join us. And first is a uh, caller with 902 is the last few digits here. And we do ask that they please unmute themselves. Welcome. Hi, this is Nina Beattie. Um, first, I want to say thank you to all the drivers who keep our city clean. I don't think they get thanked enough for their work every single week. They come by and they take the trash and they take the recycled and the yard waste, and I just really appreciate them. Um, in San Francisco, they did implement um, back about 2003 an uh, organic waste uh, where you actually got a container in your house that you could collect um, organic waste from your kitchen. Um, I don't know the situation, how that system has progressed, but I'm sure they've worked out a lot of uh, the bugs since then, um, and they might be worth consulting. Um, about 15 years ago, I approached the city about training in permaculture for city employees. Um, permaculture is a comprehensive uh, design focus on energy resources, land use, cradle to grave uses, uses, and we have resources down at Esalen Institute. They have a permaculture design uh, accreditation program as well as people in the Santa Cruz area. Um, they deal with waste. I mean, that's part of the whole focus of what permaculture does. And um, in Petaluma, a permaculture group, um, Daily Acts, has partnered with cities um, in, in the Sonoma County area to deal with all kinds of issues like this. And they even take people on tours to the uh, waste um, management centers, the dumps, and to the sewers plants, and to the water systems, so that people can see what is happening, where they're getting their resources from, and where the resources are flowing to. Um, the, when I contacted Esalen about the possibility of partnering with Monterey, the city of Monterey, to, um, to begin to rethink things like this issue, um, they were interested. They had ne it never occurred to them before that this could be a great partnership. But when I approached the city of Monterey, I was told that, number one, NIP funds don't cover training for employees. Um, and they don't cover classes. And it was just no, 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 no. And it seemed like such a missed opportunity because if Monterey can take a law like this 
and begin to rethink with the help of people who that's what they do. That's what they've been trained to do is rethink these sorts of conundrums and problems. Um, Monterey could be a, a a hot spot of its own in this regard, a, a, a tour destination of you come to Monterey to learn how to do um, this sort of waste management, to how you deal with green waste, how you deal with organics. And and permaculture experts, they train and they train others. And it's just a great, very um, fertile sort of relationship that, that makes the earth better, makes cities better. Um, I really encourage the city to contact organizations like Daily Acts, to reach out to Esalen. Um, I know people in Santa Cruz County um, that regularly do permaculture design workshops that span a whole year where they train people in all aspects of land use. Um, I really encourage the city to to investigate that so they can be in compliance with this law. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate you calling in uh, as always. And Nina, and uh, we'll go to Esther Malkin next. Hi, so I'm not sure I, I heard correctly. Um, there was a lot of information in that presentation. And so is this rolling out to residents at the same time as the hospitality industry? Or is the hospitality industry doing it first and then residents are, is my, my first question. Um, if hospitality, uh, so when you're talking about rate payers, I'm not sure if there's a difference between whether it's the hospitality industry or the residents. And lastly, I just wanna bring up a point um, that doesn't necessarily easily apply to this type of recycling that we're going to be forced into, but we have a lot of problems in a number of neighborhoods with our garbage being tampered with. Um, in my area in particular, we have people go through our garbage all the time, um, especially the recycling. And so if we put our cans out with the lids completely closed, when they've been rummaged through at whatever time of the day or night that they, they do it, by the time the truck comes by, there are times that we get accused of not having had, have had, having had the can too full that it didn't close. So I don't really know how um, the policing aspect of all of this is gonna happen. I mean, that third party that's possibly gonna have to go around you know, inspecting cans um, is something that is kind of far-fetched, but it's something that we already are having to deal with. So um, I just wanna make that point because our garbage cans are very vulnerable to anybody who walks by our house at any given day or night. Um, so it's, it's something that we're going to have to think about if we're going to start finding people. I mean, they already have a huge amount of problems with, with finding and taking pictures of the, can, of the garbage that goes into the, into the trucks from the cans and I think Delray Oaks. Um, so I'm not sure if that's been considered, but I can tell you that in my neighborhood, we have a significant problem with people going through our garbage. So, I mean, it might be something to, to think about looking at all the cans if you're going to have a third party come through, or I don't, I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up. But again, I'm not clear on exactly who the rate payer is at this point, whether it's all residents or if it's um, the hospitality businesses first and then residents. Thanks. And we'll get answers to uh, Esther's and anyone else's questions when we uh, are done with public comments. So Ted, Philip, Tim, I'm sure you got those and we'll get answers, please, uh, momentarily. Who else, Nat? That, that's all, those were our two friends. Okay, we'll close uh, the public comment on this item and bring it back to Esther's questions. Who'd like to help us with that? I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start, Thank Mayor. You, I think uh, one of the main things is um, that when, when the regulations begin in, at the beginning of next year in January, at least on the commercial end, it's going to be the larger uh, sites. So it's going to start and kind of phase down in thresholds from there. Uh, so they'll, they'll be starting at the same time as, as in January, residents will also have to have an opportunity at their household to divert food waste at their uh, residences. So not all the commercial will be impacted in January, but it's going to start in January, but we're required to offer the service to folks beginning in January at their residences. So 
um, they will have a chance to participate in the program. And from there, really, the issue is, um, and rate payer basically means anyone that has garbage service, right? What we can do in terms of differences is if there's one cost coming from one area more than another, we can have uh, a different rate increase for commercial services versus residential. We've done that in the past where uh, those um, rates can be um, adjusted differently. Uh, so it'll basically depend on the programs we need to put in place for compliance and then how we recover the costs necessary to, to uh, run them. So there is some flexibility there, but it is basically anybody that has garbage service is considered a rate payer. Um, and then finally, the issue of um, the um, rifling through recycling and that kind of thing uh, has definitely been an issue for a while uh, for folks recovering materials um, that uh, try to redeem them or uh, other kinds of things with glass or other recoverables. Uh, and it is kind of a challenge in terms of enforcement. Uh, we do try to work with the police department as well as sometimes it does happen in the middle of the night or they're breaking glass or that type of thing. But I think mostly it's uh, an issue of kind of uh, staying on the issue with enforcement and just kind of letting people that's not something we allow in the city. It is considered um, stealing uh, and it is stealing from all of us in terms of those materials go to reducing rates for all of us. So you don't wanna have people taking those recyclables. Uh, so it is something ongoing we have to look at in terms of an enforcement issue. All right, uh, let's see. I think we uh, have an internet connection problem. Uh, so uh, with our mayor, let's, uh, see if uh, maybe Vice Mayor Williamson would like to yeah t t handle the gavel for a few moments while he reconnects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there any uh, any other questions or, or comments from, from the council? Not from me. I'm ready to accept the report unless others have comment on it. Okay. Nope, nothing here. Oh, I think we have the mayor back. And you're muted, Mayor. All right, the, uh, oh, for some reason I clicked out. Huh, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> so if we can make, uh, we're gonna continue this discussion, obviously, it's a very big, big important topic as the timelines approach. And when people start hearing about rate increases and penalties and so on, that's certainly gonna raise a lot of uh, concern. So I'll go ahead and make a motion to accept the report. Okay, good. Second. Okay. Again, thank you for a very thorough report. Thanks for being here, Tim. Ted, of course. Philip, thanks so much. Uh, it's nice to know we've got you aboard here to help us uh, work our way through this. Roll call, please, to accept the report. Williamson? Yes. Oh, sorry. Smith? Yes. Albert? Yes. Hoffa? Yes. Roberson? Yes. Thank you. All right. Thanks, MK. Public comments of anything not on the agenda, please? We have a few. And uh, uh, jurisdiction to moderate, please. <laughs> yes. Uh, we'll, we'll start with, we, we've got quite a few. Okay. We'll start with the first one. Uh, again, items not on the agenda. Uh, last three digits is 992. Please announce yourself if you would like to. And that before we go much further, just a reminder to everyone that since it's not on the agenda, we're here to listen. We're not gonna, we can't discuss it and so on. Uh, a really good way to share your concerns is email suggest, suggest at monterey.org. And if you leave a contact, our, our very luminous staff will get back to you. All right, so let's hear what folks have to say tonight. All right, we'll start with 992. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council. It's Janine Trickrat, Managing Director of the Portola Hotel and Spa and Chair of the Monterey County Hospitality Association. And just wanted to give a huge shout out and thank you to Hans, Chief Hans Holder and his team, <clears throat> um, Doug at the Conference Center for holding our first vaccination clinics for food workers and throughout the Monterey Peninsula. So. It was a huge success. Um, Barbara Meister from the Aquarium partnered with uh, 
Lori Hilgut about um, creating selfies and having people post that they've been vaccinated. That too was um, hugely successful, and and uh, we had some fun prizes that we gave away. And and while Monterey County Hospitality Association took the lead on this, it really was the chambers of Monterey, Pacific Grove, Carmel by the Sea, the Cannery Row Association, the Fisherman's Wharf Association, Old Monterey Bay or Old Monterey Business. Um, all of us coming together to get the word out, and it it was it was it was wonderful. So we can't thank you enough for the generosity. I know we have another one tomorrow, and it was just very much appreciated. So thank you. Great, hey, thanks, Janine. Next uh, individual here is nine zero two. If you could please dial star six. Thanks. Hi, this is Nina Beatty again. Um, I wanted to talk tonight about the the RT-PCR test that's being used to uh, diagnose uh, COVID because this is the test on which the community has been shut down as well as the state and the country. Um, it was um, it takes the material from a person through a series of amplifications that are called CTs. Um, and experts have been warning it's deeply flawed, it's prone to error, it's for research and not diagnosis, and that the way it's being used guarantees a high percentage of false positives. Um, so if you wanna be in the purple tier, the RT-PCR is a perfect test to do that. If you get um, people tested with the CTs over 25 or 30. Um, it was given quickly emergency use authorization. It does not have FDA approval. Um, a group of uh, independent scientists formed the, under the name of International Consortium of Scientists and Life Science and issued a report in November of last year, external peer review of the RT-PCR test to detect SARS-CoV-2 reveals 10 major scientific flaws. And they said that the probability that a said person is actually infected at a threshold of 35 cycles or CTs or higher is less than 3%. The probability that said result is a false positive is 97%. And they said, in light of our re-examination of the test protocol described in the paper that hyped it initially, we've identified concerning errors and inherent fallacies which render the SARS-CoV-2 PCR test useless. Um, and they called for the paper that had been the based its acceptance to be retracted, and they they said this test should not be used. Now. The 100% the of false positive or of accurate positives are at 17 C CTs, but the CDC is saying that you can test up to 40 CTs, and the county is testing up to 45 CTs. So on the shoddy basis, the test has shut us down and put us in tears, forced people to wear masks, and ruined many people financially. Um, there are safer tests. Um, the PCR tests in, the, in collecting the samples, people's brains have actually been punctured by the probes. Um, there are these, some of these other tests are more, much more accurate. We need to understand the extent, the true extent of COVID in this community so that we can be in the correct tier. And also the vaccines, um, it's a nice idea to have a vaccine that can promote immunity, but the protocols, the test protocols, um, the previous speaker may not be aware that they were not geared to get immunity or um, to stop severe COVID reactions or to stop death or to stop hospitalization. And Dr. Fauci said this last year. So these, and now we have breakthrough um, COVID cases, so-called breakthrough. Michigan is one of the most well-known where it's, I think over Sorry, 240 and, people have gotten sick with right. COVID. Uh, we, we've ran out of time and um, I, I apologize, but uh, thanks, thanks for your public comment. And um, we can always uh, hear uh, later on, uh, I, I believe uh, Ms. Beattie has requested uh, another item be pulled relating to vaccines and not testing. So um, let's go ahead and hear from the uh, next speaker and that's Esther Malkin on items that are not on today's agenda. Yes, hi again. Um, so I wanted to first um, mention that I'm still not hearing anything um, about the RFPs that have been out there and supposedly reviewed. And I don't know why they have not, the information or any presentation has been made available to the public on the RFPs on the, the four properties that the city has that were going to be looked at for 100% affordable. 
So I'd like to get some idea on where we are with that. Um, I haven't heard back from Kim Cole after a couple of emails and um, it makes me wonder what's going on and why this is becoming so complicated. Um, secondly, I'd like to address an email that I sent in regarding um, the crime uptick on our side of the city over here. Um, you know, we always have had a higher crime rate than the rest of the city. We essentially insulate the rest of the city very much from some of the crime. And um, I took a community academy class in 2013 and they asked us where we thought the least crime happened in the city. And everybody automatically assumed it was in Old Town because that's where the police department is. And it's not, it's actually New Monterey. Why? Because New Monterey is insulated by everything leading up to New Monterey on one side, which is my side of the city, and PG and Carmel. So we cannot just, um, pay attention to the crime uptick uh, in the tourist areas. I'm curious if we are going to have the security company back um, downtown when the tourists are here so that they can free up the officers to, to respond to real crime. I'm very concerned that these things are happening at night. I doubt that most of you realize how few officers we have on at night, which is when most of the, the serious crime is happening. But I'm not even referring to minor crimes, which are, you know, I'm going to consider car break-ins and thefts of bicycles and things. I'm talking about personal crime. When somebody is sitting in their car at Del Monte Beach watching the sunset and they get robbed while they are in their car, that's very concerning. When somebody is at home and they have a home invasion while they're home at 730 at night with their child, and they escape through one end of their house while someone is getting into their house from another end. And nothing can be really done about this because there's no bail currently by executive order. That's not okay. We've got to do better on our side of the city because we are the ones that are here all year long. And, the, and focusing on the tourist areas is just not, not good enough. Thanks. Thank you, Esther. Uh, we'll go to and uh, apologize if I mispronounce your name, Eloise uh, Chim. Please uh, join us here at the city council meeting. If you could please unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon. This is Eloise Chim, and um, I'm wanting to talk about kind of a practical level in terms of the. Um, the emergency relief, the emergency rental uh, program that you had, and also wanted to thank Monterey, the city of Monterey, because they did help me out with my rent because I, I have worked, although I don't work now in the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, and they helped me out with my rent for a couple months in 2020. So I want to thank you very much for that. That was very kind and generous. Um, but what I want to know now is uh, I, I might still need that. And there has been with Biden's new COVID relief program, some amount of money that's gone to the county and I guess some to the cities and um, I'm not, I don't, I feel vulnerable to um, give all those pieces of information, paperwork, extensive paperwork to other places like the United Way or whatever else it is. So I want to know if I can just, if, if the city of Monterey has gotten some of that relief money and if I, applied again since you already have my paperwork instead of having to have my um, personal information go into relational databases through the county and the state and the federal which I, I just leaves me vulnerable 
So I just want to know, you know, if that's an option for me in case I need it, because I think I am, I'm still, you know, the schools really aren't back for sure. So anyway, thanks for, oh, and also I wanted to thank you for, although I didn't get to see it, the, um, the presentation about um, the AAPI. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad that you're raising awareness about anti-Asian hate in Monterey. Thank you. That's all for me. Great, thank you, Eloise. And uh, we'll go to 650 area code and 366 is the last three digits. If you could please dial star six to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you. This is Jean Rash. I'm a resident of Monterey. Two, two concerns, or I'll limit it to two concerns. I hope you'll work with the League of California Cities to oppose SB 556 Dodd and AB 537, which are seeking to remove municipal control over the telecom uh, utilities and the uh, utility poles. So we're we're facing this uh, attempt to to um, usurp the city's intervention, and it's just so concerning. Um, we, the oversight for these small cell antennas and the industry has to remain with the the cities and the counties, and it, that language has to stay in the state con constitution. We can upgrade our technology and protect our cities at the same time. We, and maintain local control. Um, this is a reoccurring problem in our city and it correlates with the need to finalize our small cell ordinance and our encroachment ordinance that I understand is gonna be back on your agenda. And please, we really can't let this dawdle uh, any longer. It's too, too important, we put too much money in. My second concern um, is we we have to do something about the encampments in the city of Monterey. It's just totally unacceptable. I, I'm not sure why there's not an outcry from hospitality industry that wants to show off Monterey, but um, it's totally unacceptable to me that we're watching human beings live in these conditions and that we're normalizing it so much. I, I refuse to accept it. We're now going to get what $78 million from the, the uh, Rescue America Act. We need to spend some of that on housing vouchers, put, put our homeless in temporary shelter, clean up the properties, clean up the Caltrans on ramps and off ramps, and then provide permanent housing uh, for, these, for these human beings. This is just, it's, it's very stressful. For all of society to live this way, and and while we while we do it, we can somehow find some answers in changing the federal tax codes to to eliminating the incredible wealth gaps that are going on in this country. But for now, if you could just get the people housed, stop the degradation of all the land, and I'm very frightened about the fire danger that is has such potential as we enter fire season if we haven't left it. Um, and the, the haunting of what happened at Pebble Beach in the late 80s from an encampment fire is real. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jean. All right, uh, that concludes public comment for items not on today's agenda, Mr. Mayor. Okay, as always, we thank people for their comments. Uh, I don't know if Eloise is still listening, if she has a, please call our housing office or Annette, who should she call? or email. Yep, she, she can uh, contact the city manager's office directly and we can put her in touch with the, the housing office. Uh, our email address is suggest at monterey.org. We also have uh, the housing office and I'm pulling up the phone number right now because I should have it memorized, but I don't. And um, that's 646-3995 is the phone number. 831-646-3995, and our housing office would be happy to assist. Okay, good, thanks then. Uh, I've signed a letter uh, from me to, uh, with respect to the wireless ordinances that are going down the pipe. 
So I've done that. I did not say it was from the city council. I simply said it was from me. And you all got copies. And so we'll continue to work on those two things just to answer Jean's question. All right, so we're moving along. I probably will hopefully make it by six. I think a closed session isn't going to happen, uh, but that's uh, sometimes just the way it goes. We, I should have anticipated, I think, the, how important our first two items were and we uh, allotted more time. So I'm hoping our council and staff can stay together as we get through the consent. It's my understanding uh, there are questions on number seven and number nine has been requested to be pulled. So why don't we pull both items seven and nine from the consent? Any uh, Anyone else from the audience uh, or the public that we know of who want to pull anything now? Nope, just those two items. And council, uh, questions or to pull any items? Nope. Me. I, I do have one thing that I was hoping that we could address in item number 11. Okay. Would you like to pull it or um, quickly I, or I, you can pull well, it? The, the, the only thing I have to say, and, and I'm not sure if this would cause us to want to wanna pull it, but I'm just hoping that we can make sure that the language around um, the letter is specific to using water that we already have available as opposed to making it seem like we're requesting an additional allocation. Okay. So it's just it's just clarifying the language so that it, I think it helps in, in the effort as opposed to making it seem like we're asking for more. And I'm not sure if that makes sense in what I'm saying to staff. Yes, it does. So we'll be sure if, if there needs to be a change that a motion to approve will include your suggestion. Perfect. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve all the other items that haven't been pulled on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. I'll second. I'll that. Oh, Alan beat me to it. And a roll call, please. Albert. Who, MK? That Albert. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I heard her. Smith. <laughs> Smith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. My dog is participating in the meeting now. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Williamson? Yes. Hoffa? Yes. Ann Roberson? Yes. And uh, I'm pointing, uh, let the record show it wasn't Gracie. Not this time. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> All right. I, item seven was to approve, uh, add two stop signs to an intersection on Hawthorne. So Nat, if you'll make the introduce, introduction, I, I hope uh, Andrea got the questions that she were submitted. did, absolutely, okay. yes. This, this resolution essentially transitions two intersections from a two-way stop to an all-way stop. At, this is Hawthorne Street at Irving and Hawthorne Street at uh, McClellan Avenue, both in uh, the new Monterey neighborhood. And this recommendation comes on the heels of two TIP projects. These are curb extensions at the two intersections. And it comes from a safety perspective, not environmental, not traffic calming, but based on a traffic safety analysis and a site distance analysis with the goal to achieve better pedestrian visibility among drivers. And traffic engineer Andrea Rennie will be providing a brief summary of this recommendation and answer any questions that you or members of the public might have on the issue. Andrea. Thank you, Nat. Mayor Roberson, council members, good afternoon. So this was a decision made uh, based on safety. And if I can share my screen, I just want to show a little bit of the crash history at this location. And I apologize if um, it's a little bit pixelated. So if you can look at the crashes, I know these are 18 um, years of crash history. You can see there are a lot of right angle or what we call broadside crashes. Those are normally injury crashes. So if we look at Hawthorne and McClellan, we have a total of 19 collisions that could have been corrected with the installation of an all-way stop. And in looking at Hawthorne and Irving, we have 22 collisions. And again, please keep in mind, these are um, 18 years of collisions. So the California Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices requires five crashes in a 12 month period. So we do not meet that criteria. However, we do meet a criteria that says that if a road user after stopping cannot see conflicting traffic is not able to negotiate 
the stop without advancing, then we can place an always stop. So currently we have um, eight intersections on Hawthorne. Six of them are always intersections, always stops. And these two are the only ones that are not always stop. So one of the things that happens when you have um, an intersection that stops and then you don't stop at the next one, but the crosswalks are those high visibility uh, ladder zebra crosswalks that we have, it can create an illusion of an always stop. So that illusion of an always stop can cause people to stop and then we can have rear end crashes. Uh, we do have um, a pedestrian accident on Hawthorne and Irving. So because of that condition, what we did is with the NCAP project and the bull bouts that shortened the pedestrian crossing, it made the intersection much safer and we're actually able to get some parking spaces back. If we choose to retain the no, not the all-way stop control at the intersection, just the two-way stopping Irving or stopping McClellan at Hawthorne, we would have to further take out parking spaces. So probably about at least eight at each intersection in order to get that stopping site distance. So if there's a car traveling 25 miles an hour on Hawthorne, it takes them about 155 feet to stop, to see another car crossing and stop. If they're traveling at 30 miles an hour, it would take them 200 feet to stop. So we don't have that stopping site distance. So these, um, the recommendation to install always stop on Hawthorne and Irving and McClellan was based on safety. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Andrea. Good report, as always. Uh, council questions before we go to the public? No. All right, uh, do we have public comment, please? We Matt? do not have public comment, Mr. Mayor. We don't, okay. Mayor, why was this, who pulled this one? It, there was a, an email from uh, Carl Outson. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve. Right. I'll second that. Yeah, so uh, Mr. Outson had emailed me that I passed on. Um, it was kind of late, but it got into the public record and he had asked those questions, which uh, Andrea was able to answer, I think. Okay, beautiful. Okay. So we have motion and a second roll call, please. And instead of saying yes or I, you can say woof. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Smith? Yes. All right, Williamson. Yes. Albert? Yes. Papa? Yes. Roberson? Oh, nobody would do it. Woof, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, but. <laughs> you can do it next time. <laughs> Thank you. You know, those, those uh, back in the day, but didn't they have those funny uh, um, paintings of there were dogs, I think all playing cards or something, right? We should do one with all of our dogs at a, running a city council meeting, right? <laughs> that would be funny. Well, at least to me. All right, so uh, item nine was a, a request for Ms. Beatty to pull that to share her thoughts. And I think uh, during earlier public comments, she shared some of those. I We did receive her, um, very extensive email, which was entered into the public record. And so Nat, uh, an overview please of uh, what the issue is and we'll have Ms. B have an opportunity to share her thoughts with us and others in the public. Great, happy to provide a, a very brief overview. Uh, as many of you know, the city of Monterey is the only city government in our county to administer vaccines directly to eligible populations. To date, Fire Chief Panholzer and the Monterey Fire Department have administered 2,514 doses of the COVID-19 vaccines with hundreds more doses planned in the upcoming weeks. And as Janine Chikarat called in earlier, a vaccine clinic for 300 people at the Monterey Conference Center tomorrow. The Fire Department currently receives vaccines directly from the County of Monterey. And as it's been widely reported in the news, Governor Newsom entered into a statewide third party administrator, also known as a TPA agreement with Blue Shield of California to manage 
the state's enhanced vaccine provider network. Public agencies must enter into agreements with an agency known as CalGovOps. It's the California Government Operations Agency, and it's a state agency to be able to join the statewide network that's managed by Blue Shield. And the state of California has uh, notified us and they've told us that since we're a public agency directly administering vaccines to the public, we must enter into an agreement with CalGovOps in order to continue to administer or receive vaccines. This recommended action is to authorize the city manager to execute an MOU with the state so that the fire department can continue its efforts to inoculate members of our community. And um, available for any questions that you may, you may have uh, on this item and uh, the agenda report provides a little bit more detail on what this entails. Okay, thanks for the uh, brief overview. And again, uh, we did get a very elaborate, well-researched email from Ms. Beatty. And so uh, we'll open it up to public comment, please. Great, and I believe our uh, first caller is Ms. Beatty. And if you could please unmute, thank you. Thank you, this is Nina Beatty. Um, yes, I, I wrote to request that the city council, it's state uh, city-sponsored vaccination events um, and not go through with this MOU. Um, as I started to explain in the, during public comment, the vaccine protocol endpoints were only for reducing mild symptoms. They don't stop transmissibility. They were not for re reducing severe COVID effects, hospitalizations, or deaths. Um, and But state and federal officials are telling the public that vaccination confers immunity and safety and that vaccinated people can travel and mingle, which means that people with the disease can come to Monterey into the newly reopened facilities, hospitality workers and guests um, can more freely circulate and they believe they cannot transmit COVID or receive it because of the vaccines and that's not the case according to the protocol endpoints. Um, these vaccines um, inject messenger RNA to, into the cells so that the cells manufacture COVID-19 spike proteins. But recent research um, over the last six months has shown that the COVID-19 spike proteins may be causing the severe COVID-19 damage outside the lungs and the nasopharyngeal area, the, um, affecting the lining of the blood vessels, the heart, the brain, the kidneys, liver, skin, and fat, resulting in blood clots, low platelets, brain hemorrhages, heart attacks, neurological problems, and immune overreaction. Um, these vaccines, by making the body produce the thing that could be causing a lot of the disease, are very, very risky. And no one is responding to questions on this. The research uh, scientists, the doctors, and members of the public such as myself who bring the extensive body of research and the evidence to officials and officials, health officials are ignoring us. Um, the spike proteins are also similar in structure to the spike protein that's needed for pregnancy, Sincitin-1, and it's feared that an immune response against the COVID-19 spike protein could attack Sincitin-1, causing infertility in women. Um, the vaccine's artificial mRNA can be reverse transcribed to a person's DNA. Um, this is something that's newly being discussed and researched. The vaccines contain uh, elements like polyethylene glycol or polysorbate 80, which can cause anaphylactic reactions. Um, there have been, as of um, March 25th, 26th, on the CDC site, there have been uh, 50,869 adverse events following COVID vaccination. These include 22, over 2,200 deaths, over 7,700 serious injuries, 104 miscarriages or premature births, 578 cases of Bell's palsy, and 2,578 anaphylactic reactions. But this, the government's own research shows that these reports, it's a voluntary system, are only one to 10% of the total sorry, Beattie, vaccine but, uh, responses. We'll, and I asked the city uh, to halt its- Stop this uh, uh, timer and, uh, and continue on uh, due to our time limits and uh, our meeting today. Let's see if we have any other callers. And uh, looks like we do not have any other public commenters on this item and we'll hand this back over to Mayor Riverson. I'd like to okay. move approval of the I'll item. I'll second. 
All right, and I just want to remind the public that we did uh, the information that Ms. B was so kind to share with us orally, we did receive in writing, uh, and we do have uh, time limits that we just have to respect so we can get here all of our business done. So and we if have I a motion second. Comment, comment, if I can, I just, yeah, I just want to urge the public that if you can get vaccinated, please get vaccinated. And um, there, there's a lot of information out there, but you want to make sure you're listening to experts. Please consult with the Monterey County Health Department or with the Center for Disease Control. And, um, and please, if you have an opportunity to get vaccinated, do so. Really happy I was able to get my second vaccination um, yesterday. Thank you, Alan. All right. Um, seeing no one else, roll call, please. Papa? Yes. Albert? Yes. Smith? Yes. Williamson? Yes. Roberson? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have a public appearance item, and that has to do with the salary schedule and just, uh, I think, uh, some accounting cleanup and so on, updating. So, Nat, again, just a quick overview, then we'll see if there's any or any questions in public comment? Absolutely, uh, very quick. So the action before you this afternoon is intended to achieve two goals. First is that it updates the uh, salary schedule to include the voluntary 10% salary reduction and 2% cost of living adjustment postponement that both the city manager and the city attorney have voluntarily elected to continue through the end of April, 2021. These reductions and deferrals uh, initially took effect on May 1 of 2020. The second is that it updates the temporary and seasonal part-time salary schedule. State law requires that CalPERS agencies regularly post and update positions and pay rates, and this action allows us to comply with state law. And Human Resources Director Allison Hauck will be delivering the full report on behalf of our team. Allison. And unfortunately, she's muted, or at least we can't hear her. I'm not sure if there's a mic uh, check. Okay, is that working? That's working, yep. Yeah. Oh, okay, it was just down. Thank you, so, excuse me. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, as the Assistant City Manager described, this is a routine update of the salary schedules, but we routinely do it when there are changes that um, we need to update it and post it publicly. Um, we are also looking to add some additional part-time seasonal positions um, to allow some flexibility as we open the Sports Center in a gradual process. We want to bring some people back that worked at the higher levels, but we only have the entry level positions. So we just wanted to um, create part time seasonal positions um, right now so that we can gradually open until we're able to open um, at the full capacity. We're also adding two human resources part time positions as well um, as the pandemic continues and as we have other issues with social justice and things like that. We um, also only had an entry level position as a part time position and while we have special projects we wanted to be able to bring on people at a higher level for some part time projects. So we added those to the salary schedule as well. Um, we don't intend that they will um, uh, be full time positions. These are just part time positions to help us in this transition. And uh, what is the question? Yeah, what is the fiscal impact to our budget? So the part-time seasonal positions um, are already budgeted within the departments and they just have to stay within their departments. They're given an allocation for part-time seasonal. So there is no additional budget allocation. The city manager and city attorney's concessions um, pro provide an additional savings. Um, so again, no additional budget allocation. Okay, good. And we certainly want to thank our, our two executives for showing the way and making that uh, sacrifice for us because we were looking at about a $30 million uh, loss of revenue. And with our fingers crossed, I think we may be going orange as of tomorrow. Sorry, <laughs> that wasn't the dog. <laughs> and so uh, with a $30 million uh, deficit, and we're, we're far away from economic recovery so far. So I'm happy to hear we don't have a fiscal impact from that. And we can bring some folks aboard. Questions? All right, uh, any public comment? 
No public comment. All right, I'll move, make a motion to uh, approve. Second. Second. Resolution, okay. Roll call, please. Smith. Smith. Yes. Williamson. Yes. Hoffa. Woof. Oh. <laughs> yes. That's a yes. <laughs> Albert. Yes. Thank you. Oh, and Roberson. Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank good. you. That was great. So, uh, folks, uh, we had a longer meeting than anticipated. I, I don't think we're going to have time. I'm sure everybody has other things on their schedule. So we'll do our closed session at our next meeting. And so unless there are some burning council or city manager reports, I would suggest we adjourn. All right. It sounds like we can do that. Once again, uh, thanks to the public, our wonderful staff, and our city council for another very productive, informative meeting. I appreciate you all. Have a good evening.